You're listening to Dots, Lines, and Destinations, a travel podcast with host Stephen Seagraves, Fosma Moon, and Seth Miller. Hello, and welcome to episode 480 of Dots, Lines, and Destinations. I'm Stephen Seagraves, joined by the usual cast of characters, Seth Miller and Foz Maloon. Hey, guys. Howdy. You guys uh, doing well? Yeah. I had a theory, by the way, on the... Uh, we got a shout-out on LinkedIn from someone I've never heard of before, so thanks for that random listener, um, who tagged me and Stephen, but not Foz. <laughs> you have a theory? Okay. They couldn't understand Foz's name because of the way you say it. Anyway. Oh, God. <laughs> Faz Mahmoud. There we go. How's that? <laughs> wow. Come on. It was a softball I had to take. It's way. You know, we've, we've never actually talked about it, but we're kind of a bad religious joke. We've got a Jew, a Muslim, and a Christian on the podcast. Walked into an airplane. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not in trouble at all. <laughs> Who gets stopped first? Uh, anyway, uh, let's talk about Spirit. They've uh, deferred some fleet changes or some, I guess, some some purchases. New aircraft, yeah. So this actually came out a couple weeks ago. We just never got around to talking about it. But they, uh, their 2025 and 2026 deliveries, basically everything more than a year out. Uh, not so much anymore. They got pushed five years out now to the, into the 2030s. Hmm. So this is, I actually didn't look up exactly how many planes it is, but it was a, a decent chunk. Um, and, you know, part of this, we can say, you know, and we'll talk a little bit about this with United as well, is... Uh, the manufacturer is not necessarily being able to deliver everything as promised, but part of it is clearly uh, spirit, maybe not so much with the rampant growth and, you know, unbridled optimism that they had maybe a couple of years ago. So, well, we, we talked about last week, they were, they're starting some new routes. Yeah. They're, but they're pulling out of, of routes as well. Like they're, they're kind of killing some routes. So it's, it seems like they're just trying to find a sweet spot for themselves potentially. Yeah. I mean, I like always, can we, where, where do you put the planes to make money? One of the nice things in theory about aviation is the planes are very expensive, but they're portable. Yeah. They don't work in one market. You move them to another. Yeah. Uh, that's at least the theory that the challenge becomes at some point, are there enough markets? And, mm. you know, when you hear, I want to say it was Breeze maybe that had a quote saying, we think there's 2000 markets, city pairs we can serve or something like that. And like, okay, cool story, bro. But like, probably not. There's probably not 2000 point to point city pairs that any airline is going to serve successfully um, yeah. without a hub, uh, especially. So, you know, that that's where it always gets a little interesting. Like, right. 2000, if, you, if you've got hubs involved, 2000 isn't actually that bad. Yeah. 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 I, I, I mean, I see it as, I see most of this as Airbus can't deliver and our merger with JetBlue fell through. So we're trying to figure out what to do. And I would probably flip those two. The, 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 the bigger one is the JetBlue merger. Right. But I remember, Remember that JetBlue, one of the big reasons they JetBlue was so excited about the merger was the order book. Mm. Yeah. Um, the fact that, you know, everybody is sort of trying to rejigger delivery schedules and get them to a, you know, a smoother flow. And again, United talked about in their earnings call last week, a bow wave of expected deliveries that, you know, was unreasonable because so much had been delayed and sorted in this and that um, and shifted, I should say, uh, that getting to a more reasonable flow of aircraft intake, it turns out to be a good idea. Yeah, well, let's talk about United. Then. I mean, you kind of brought it up. So, like, they originally expected 101 planes this year, 2024, and now that expectation is down to 66 per their earnings call. Yeah, and that 101, there's actually supposed to be 183 by contract, mm -hmm. and that included some that had been delayed from prior years, right? And so that's this is the bow wave that uh, the executives were talking about on the call. So you can imagine, like. That's a lot. Even two a week is a lot, but um, which would be the 101, roughly. Yep. Yep. Uh, the 66 now is 61 single aisle and five seven eight sevens. I mean, that's that's a third of what they had originally contracted. Yes. Uh, and so, right, this is the, they stopped new pilot hires. They're having all sorts, like they're laying some training programs, shifting things around. Yeah. Trying to figure out what the level of growth that they should have that makes sense is. And it's, one of the interesting comments that also came up in the earnings call was about growth and, you know, options and does losing all these new planes or delaying these new plane deliveries really slow growth or not. And the comment, interestingly, was we still got a bunch of old planes that we can decide when we want to retire. So, you know, they've got a few years and we'll try to take that to mean up to five probably of useful life left. If we have to or want to keep them in service, we can. If we get new planes to replace them we can 
if demand stays high, we'll keep them in service. If demand pulls back a little, we can just retire the old ones because we've got these new ones. So, um, yeah, it was interest. It's an interesting blend it's, of options. Well, it's also like a shareholder call, right? So, like everything's about growth. Like it, it's instead of how are you going to get better? Uh, <laughs> no, it's not about growth. It's about profitability. Yeah. Okay. Fair. But growth drives profitability in most people's eyes, right? So maybe, maybe not. <laughs> In the airline world, it is often difficult to cut to growth. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sometimes so, it works. Sometimes you're right. Sometimes you're overextended and it can work. But so uh, so let's talk. Let's talk then about like they have these 66 planes that are on order or expected right, this, this year. year. Right? Can they actually add those planes given their uh, issues with the FAA right now? No. So even if they get the 66 <laughs> delivered, they may sit at Boeing for it until in yeah they would probably take delivery and Boeing would deliver them to wherever United wants to park them but yes yeah. yeah um so this is something that came up during the earnings call and I guess we didn't really know this until then um you know one of the I think it was I think it was luckily Joseph from CNBC asked like what what is the FAA investigation really doing to impact you what is what can you can and can't you do and Kirby was very optimistic and like you know we love safety, rah, 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 kind of thing. But also noted that uh, the captain upgrades are not restricted. And we mentioned that a couple of weeks ago, talking about that they got their approval from the FAA to do the check ride stuff. So that's not restricted, but the, or to continue doing the check ride stuff. Uh, the thing that came out though, is that new deliveries right now, the FAA is not allowing them to be added to the operating certificate. For anybody so, or for just for United during this review. Oh, okay. So that's the, actually pretty interesting because going back to your prior comment, that means they don't pick up the planes. Boeing actually has to fly them to somewhere United wants, I presume. Oh, because the Boeing pilot United wouldn't take to the pilots wouldn't take delivery with them not on certificate. Exactly. exactly. That was cute the way you got to uh, <laughs> It's almost like Foz and I think alike sometimes. Weird. Uh, I, I hadn't considered that. I'm not sure how that delivery would go. May, you're right. Maybe it's contractual delivery, but then they sit because United isn't allowed to move them. Maybe. There's an exception that the FAA allows them to be ferried but not operated. I don't know. But they, if they can't be added to the operating cert, then I presume United's pilots can't fly. I don't know. I mean, and and you, you couldn't get a tail number. Like, I, it's, a, it's a weird conundrum, right? Well, you can well, get you, the tail number because they get assigned early and then transferred. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Well, so good news, bad news on that. United says there's only three of them expected in the next, like, month or two, and then heavily weighted back half of the year for... Uh, remaining deliveries, so maybe it's not an issue, but we'll see. Yeah, and then and let's talk. Let's talk about A321s, right? Because United said they've ordered 35 A321 Neos uh, uh, with CFM engines, so that's a big deal. The other A320 Neo and XLR fleet that they have on order is the Pratt Whitney geared turbo fan, which I'm I'm a little torn on this decision. Someone's like, you know, this is a huge deal, and it is. It's mixed engine fleet is a big deal it's extra spare parts there's costs associated with that right mm -hmm. um but these planes are coming from lessors so they're going to be leased not bought uh someone else already has spoke you know has committed to them and they're coming in 2026 and 2027 so two years from now at which point in theory the pratt and whitney gtf engine issues are probably supposed to be in the rearview mirror i mean that's that's optimistic but okay <laughs> hey listen i said probably and supposedly I, I, I mean, what's the what's the big deal, right? Like, why not just go with all CFM? Well, you can't switch the. I mean, I guess you could switch the. Yeah. No, 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 no. Right. I'm saying what I'm saying is, is like, okay, so switch your your future orders, and right. then and then go to all the the CFM engines. Um, Probably because when they bought the aircraft, they also placed an order for the engine. Oh, yeah. Pratt would not be too keen. I would imagine to let them out uh, of that contract. Okay. I mean, I just feel like they're setting themselves up for a problem here. Well, I, so one of the interesting things, I think, Foz, you raised this, is what happens with a 35-plane subfleet? Right. And, you know, it's the right size-ish to replace the 752s. So these these all become transatlantic birds? Transcon birds. Uh, they're, I mean, doing, they're doing transcon, transcons on 777Ws now. Yeah, they, they don't really do a lot of... The, the 75s are just filling in the odd times to LA and San Yeah, well... So part of that is obviously there's more demand for transcom service, but um, and there's challenges in terms of flight constraints. So you can't just keep adding more flights. But no, uh, and so maybe some of these uh, do become some trans. I don't. I don't think these would go transatlantic. No. Okay. Um. You to get 
the best you could probably do London from Newark, mm-hmm. but anything longer than that or, or Ireland, right? This look at JetBlue's route map yeah. for a hint. So JetBlue is puts its neos into London occasionally and mostly into uh, Dublin. And I don't know. Or, if there's enough, I don't know if there's enough demand into Dublin. I mean, how many neo, how many flights can you have? I mean, they have two, but how many more could you have? So I mean, historically, United did a triple seven and a seven five, like triple yeah, seven year round. That's what they're doing. Seven five for augmented summer capacity, right? Yeah, that's what they're doing still. But I mean, if with three twenty ones that can cross the pond, they could go back to a lot of the secondary cities they left. Mm-hmm. I guess. I get that. I'm wondering how many did they really leave at this point, though? Man- Manchester, Birmingham. Edinburgh, um, Bristol. Edinburgh. They sort of Bristol. Edinburgh still. Not year round. I'm pretty sure United starts Edinburgh. Um, Bristol. Yep. Yeah. Not Copay, Oslo, Stockholm. Right. And with SAS leaving, there's an opportunity for Scandinavia. It can, it can technically it can technically do Oslo. It did. They used to the seven five. Well, I'm saying the ne- I'm saying the Neos. Yeah. So if he, I, I would say that the Neo can do most of what the seven, at least you know most of what the seven five did without trouble. As you get to the very end of the seven five range, like the Berlin, which was mm-hmm. always, you know, we can debate how much that really was within range or not. Um, that becomes probably you need an LR at least. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Right. Like, again, I go back to JetBlue. JetBlue for Paris and Amsterdam want, needed the LR. Mm-hmm. Need slash one. Right. And again, it, it's, part of that is published, you know, faceplate range versus actual and divergent time and all that other stuff. But, um, so, so, so they're taking these planes. You think they're going to do transcons, potentially, maybe some Europe stuff. I mean, they're going to have to put to to be, um, to be competitive transcon wise. They're going to have to put live flat seats in. I think. Right. I think they're. I think we're more likely to see that uh, see them going to Hawaii than transcons. You think they get based in like San Francisco, LAX, and that's what they do? Just turns. Yeah. And how, what's the seating on them? We don't know yet. I, I mean, I could see them Foz like doing like Houston, LA, Honolulu back, or LA to. Lahui or whatever and back and kind of rotating through Denver and Houston down to LA or something becoming if, if they have enough seats yeah um, and they, they'll probably do the secondary transcon markets as well I just don't see them unless they want a premium product and I don't see LA in San Francisco yeah I, I'm, I'm expecting that the 35 might get the premium product and again because it's a separate subfleet you don't have to like you can isolate spare parts and some things like that I think that that might work so if you do that Right, and they they have these thirty five. Then come the deliveries of the three twenty one neos with the Pratt and Whitney engines. Do you just start re- returning these to lessors then, and pulling out the seats and putting them in your new planes? I would imagine it's a ten to twelve year lease. That's difficult. Oh, okay. Um, so I would assume that these stay in the fleet for a decade, and by then the Max tens have showed up or something else. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa! whoa. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> That's not a decade. Right <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it does uh, have Max ten in it, so. FYI, I just pulled it up in Syrium. Glasgow, Manchester, Prague, and Berlin are the uh, cities that are zeroed out in Q2 of 2024 that were served in Q2 of 2019, mm-hmm. while Nice, uh, Port, uh, what is it, Punta Delgado, Palma de Mallorca, and Tenerife have been added. I mean, so, they could do Tenerife, easy. One, yeah, some Tenerife, Punta Delgado, and even Palma de Mallorca. And Palma de Mallorca is a similar population, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I just, I, so, Ryan, Punta Delgado is a was a max eight last summer. I assume yeah. it is still. So right, like so. Again, there, there's some of these could absolutely be served by a 321 neo, but I think um, they're not that much lower on European markets than they were. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's let's talk about those max tens then. Uh, for the next couple of years, United. That was a fun one. They they mentioned that they converted some to become nines. Uh, mm-hmm. It turns out that some is 110. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Word words are fun. Wait, how yeah. many did they have in order total? 250. Okay. Of the tens? Yeah, they bought a lot of them. Wow. They committed to a lot of them. And, and again, the commitment to the 10 came with the caveat. I don't remember who asked this. I was at the United Next event when it was asked, and I or someone else, you know, when they when they announced the order, where someone was like, well, the, you're ordering planes that aren't, uh, aren't certified yet, and then, you know, how are you going to deal with that? And this was already, this was 21, I think, summer. So things were already a little sideways on, you know, max things. And the United executives comment was, we can always convert them to eights and nines as we need to. And they are. Again, Apparently they need to. <laughs> right. And, so, and this is a blend of we need deliveries and, you know, of anything. And, you know, what's best for the company and for the fleet plan. Obviously, they'd want the bigger planes, but if they can't get them, 
they'll take a discount from Boeing and take the smaller planes and keep growing because those are planes that they will theoretically get over the next you know three or four years. Uh, it's I mean, the good news is maybe by twenty five to twenty seven they'll actually have their FAA issues in, uh, figured out too. Eh, it'll probably be faster than that. <laughs> One would hope. Um, yeah, no, there, there's a lot, obviously a lot of moving parts there, and then on top of all of it, uh, I think. The most exciting bit is probably the Polaris Plus sort of comments that Andrew Nacella made during the earnings call. We, we we have different definitions of exciting, but okay, interesting. I don't know. <laughs> well, we we talked about right. We talked about this last week also, and yeah, the, like yeah. ring for ring for champagne button. Um, and the version of the survey I got in February was probably a little different than the version that precipitated these articles in mid April and whatever. But uh, Jamie Baker, who's the analyst for JP Morgan, I remember yeah, correctly. I think so. Yeah. Um, ask the question, you know, somewhat tongue in cheek of when am I going to get my ring for champagne button, but more, you know, and he would be a guy who would use that. He's, he's, he's an av geek like us. Uh, he actually worked, I want to say continental route management, maybe back in the day, a route <laughs> one. Anyway, he did some time in Guam, if I remember correctly, but, uh, <laughs> so did we, <laughs> <laughs> ouch. Um, but anyway, he, he was talking, he's like, you know, is there an opportunity for more premium? in Polaris and Nacella's comment was essentially to the effect of we're always looking at opportunities for further segmentation, even in our premium cabins. And between that comment and the survey I got that said, you know, a limited number of seats within the cabin, which makes me think bulkhead row. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that there is an opportunity for a, you don't just get a larger screen or a larger footwell, but, and maybe, you know, maybe a little more space, but there's other amenities that come with having that. And, it's a uh, price up charge from the regular business class cabin. You, you pay for it or, you know, GS gets it or something like that, but it allows for some increased revenue and segmentation, right? This is, this is not new. And uh, American also announced it. We have that on the schedule here. They've got a version of it coming too. Like there's a dozen airlines maybe now that have some version of front row is special at the mm -hmm. point. So har hard to call it a, crazy idea by any stretch right this isn't I, I think i think our problem i mean i'm speaking for Foz. i'll let Foz speak for himself but i think my problem was is again what we talked about last week like if you're going to segment everything you you better make it worth it because if it's just the seat which is probably what they're going to end up and and do they're going to say look you're paying for the bulkhead seat the front row with more leg room and you know whatever um but then like the soft stuff is going to it's is going to suck unless they actually take the time to implement it right um and that's where I think it falls short. I don't know, Boz, what you think, but uh, I mean, I, I'm in line with you, right? Like the problem with United is you, you've really got two groups of um, onboard folks, right? Which is you've got the more junior people who are much more customer service focused versus the jaded old people who could give a rat's ass. <laughs> but, and right, and a lot of these, a lot of the jaded people end up on these more premium routes, and so yeah. you're going to charge higher for a premium uh, for a product where you're going to have people who are disenfranchised to help customers generally or feel like it's in, an inconvenience when they ask you for something like a glass of water. Yeah. Like, you know, I was going to say, like, I think that's, I think that's part of it. But then I like looked at like Brian Kelly, right. Points guy. He, he had a, he's headed to Cape town, right. On United and his food, he's in business class. His food is inedible basically on a 14 hour flight. Like that, that's ridiculous. Like I, if, I mean, who knows how, if he paid for it and who cares, but his, the product that he's delivered is not great. So I think United needs to fix that first before they start segmenting things um, for, for more money because they, they're not getting the basic thing, right? I'm yeah. sorry. And then, I'm no, sure. Well, no, and to something Seth said, right, like like a bigger screen, the problem now becomes if you change the seat, attributes of the seat other than the footwell, mm -hmm. you now have to start stocking additional parts at all the outstations and at your hubs in case something ever breaks. Yeah. Right. And then there's a cost burden for that. And to do that for two or three seats, I think is short sighted. Yeah. I mean, let's, let's talk a little bit. About, I mean, I think it's good to talk about AA's thing here, Seth, since we can kind of contrast, compare and contrast kind of with the, yeah. So American launching what they're calling flagship business preferred, uh, flagship business is their new premium business class product for long haul flights. And it's going to be, uh, on the new seven, eight, seven deliveries dash nines and on the triple seven, 300 ER retrofitting. And this is, they're getting rid of first class. It's going to be a very premium, heavy configuration, a lot of seats. And it's funny, I went back and looked. They announced this in October, September, October of 2022. Mm. And in the story I wrote about it at the time, I was like, I mentioned, and they don't seem to be doing anything in the front row, which is weird. 
Mm-hmm. And it turns out they either, you know, hadn't planned to when they read my story and decided to change their mind or more likely uh, they uh, had always planned to and were keeping it a secret so until they had something good to announce. And so in the announcement last week, which I weirdly was like all about uh, amenity kits and food, they also sort of slipped in. And oh, by the way, the front row is going to be special. And so it'll be uh, a, basically a first class amenity kit and first class bedding in the business class seat in the bulkhead with better space is so mm-hmm. far what's been announced. So again, remember American has flagship lounges and flagship dining at yeah. some airports that theoretically, if you're that they probably aren't going to close even as they get rid of flagship first and again, flagship lounges and especially flagship dining. If I remember correctly, dining was for first class passengers only or people who bought in and, and something like that. So yeah. And, uh, and, believe that's right. and the flagship lounge was, business and first is that right yes but not but not admiral's club which was uh for i guess lower tier status and domestics anyway it's they have a lot of crap there um anyway but like so maybe this business preferred gets the dining instead of just the lounge and like you could do you could imagine a few little things like that that also add on but at least for now and we don't know everything it seems like american hasn't completely tried to over promise on what the benefits will be it's a different amenity kit and some additional bedding those are easy to deliver do 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 those lounges those lounges are only in la and jfk right no i think they're in miami and there's la miami dallas as well dallas has it too i think hubs have them so maybe not charlotte because charlotte never had first class but chicago has it oh really so it was a lounge but not the dining so if it's if it's the front row right let's just say it's four seats maybe maybe eight max eight. um how does that how does that work because i mean those aren't it's not enough customers for those lounges depending on your flight setup and like where they're flying the seven eight nines and the triple seven w's well they don't have that many first class seats today true so if you're basing it on that same number this actually i don't say you're gonna have more but you'll probably sell more of them okay true. right if you, if you the seven seven w's had eight six f today i think and you're gonna have eight now if we get two rows of this you have to end up with more seats on those planes. So basically, they're adding first class without saying they're adding first class. Exactly. Yeah. And the the value, well, right, the, the value proposition there is a few things. One, you go back to business first and upper class. 25 years ago, the concept of those pro- products, and it's probably 30 years ago now at this point, where Virgin Atlantic and Continental were selling what they considered to be a more premium business class, and many passengers agreed at the time, uh, as a business class, a more, a more premium business class close to a first class, but they sold it a business class for people in corporate contracts that couldn't buy first class. It was compelling. But the difference is that was the entire cabin. It wasn't a sub section of the cabin, right? This is just going to become employee class all over again. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not as convinced of you of that, right? I think first class absolutely is. But in this case, A, they'll sell to the last seat and someone will get op upped into this more often. Maybe an employee on standby. But they, again, right, you, you can see this moving in that direction a little better, I think. And B, I think that you'll find people who are able to put it on an an expense account can get this. And maybe it's a status-based access, maybe it's dollar-based, but depending on how strict uh, accounting departments are, my business class ticket and a $300 seat assignment to get get on board. That's not due. I think they'll sell some of them. I don't think they're going to sell all the seats. And I think you'll find employees in more of these seats than not. Airlines never sell all their seats, so... I think it's I think it's going to depend on the route. Um really. I think some of them they'll probably sell. Like I could see this being a popular thing on, you know, LA, London or something. Um I I, I do wonder do how does this impact like their contracts with the movie studios? Cuz we've talked about it a little bit with their transcons and losing they're not going to have first class anymore. Do you think this this hurts some of their LA you know movie star traffic that they are okay. Yeah. No. I mean I, I'm not sure how much of that was. I, I know that there was the theory that they that was driving keeping first around. They they announced two years ago that they were going to drop first, eighteen months ago. So they they're not worried about it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Whether they should be or not, you know, maybe. But I think that contract was redone as well, not a while ago, so that they didn't yeah. get first. They got business. No, okay. Well, I could that could play into it. I think that was one of the reasons why United yeah. left, right? Yeah, because if they were always selling those first class seats at those crazy fairs, they wouldn't have left JFK. Okay? No, that's that's true. Yeah. Um. In addition to this, uh, Provo is American's future. Didn't think I'd see that as a headline, but 
<laughs> yeah, I like Brett. Uh, it's a fun story. Uh, basically, the theory here is uh, American has added more flights at Provo serving Phoenix and Dallas. So hub connections two a day at one and two a day to Phoenix, uh, to Dallas and once a week, once a day to Phoenix. And the the idea that the argument Brett is making here is given Americans focus on smaller markets and you know regional feed and being able to extract higher yield because they are sort of the only player with good service in town. And I'm going to say good service as in frequency and breadth, not necessarily quality. Um, that Provo right now is a couple of different routes on Breeze and Allegiant. And this gives some daily, you know, onward frequent connections to other places that might be better. I mean, I, I see the point, right? I, Provo, I mean, it, Provo is now arguably a true um, suburb, far suburb of Salt Lake City. So it also kind of differentiates you from Delta when you're talking about flying into, you know, Salt Lake City. It, it, SLC is far from Provo when you like look at a map. Um, so it gives you some differentiation there. And then if you if you can charge a premium for it, you know, why not? At, at that point, it makes sense to me. I'm surprised more airlines haven't. Yeah. I mean, even if you're not charging a premium for it, you're getting the folks who are nearby. You're charging a premium over Breeze, perhaps, and you're getting the you know because you can offer daily service. And it's again, it's the people who don't necessarily go everywhere that Delta flies, or, yeah. you know, nonstop. And so there's a lot of Delta flies to plenty of places nonstop from Salt Lake, but not everywhere. And so if you're connecting anyways, especially like and, and you might be, or whatever, like there's a lot of opportunities there. And you might be paying the premium for the nonstop on Delta, whereas on American you could be paying significantly less potentially and yeah. take the connection. So. I think I, I think it makes sense. Um, how long until United does this? <laughs> I, you know, I think United has sort of tried it in some places. Payne Field isn't a good example, and they walked from that. Uh, I'm not sure Provo is the right place for United then to try it, but where where to, you know, there's got to be places to do it. Now that now that the market in, I mean, now that COVID, I, mean, I think COVID really killed Payne for United. That's what. Yeah. I, do you think they could go back? I mean, it's it still seems like a very weak market up there and i don't know why I, it just feels that way like it feels like alaska even struggles to get enough traffic maybe it's an all e-175 operation that's what it needs no, to be no no it needs to be an airbus operation <laughs> it ain't bowen i ain't going uh anyway that's a boss terrible to be fair to be fair alaska did it all in Bear for a while I mean, and now they're doing, you know, seven, three, maybe it's just finding the right place. Like I, you see a lot of people like snowbirds going to like Phoenix now, like yeah. that's, that market seems to be pretty stable. Um, but I don't know, like why did San Francisco struggle so much? Like it's just, it's weird. I mean, I, you know, you've got Bellingham to the North. Yeah. Right. You, you which is Southwest, which is a Southwest, you know? Yeah. But you could, you could bulk up for, to attract some of the Bellingham traffic, the Vancouver traffic, right? Oh, that's true from Bellion, but you have to make an investment. You have to get a little aggressive on pricing. And I don't know the parking situation in that pain. That that would be the other wild card. Pain was free, I think. Close to free. I think it's but free at Bellingham. Yeah, but how many spots do they have? Oh, not much. It's not a ton of parking. And, and that's, Bellingham that. has very little service these days. Yeah, it, it was, but it's like south, it's like only Southwest, right? You've got uh, a couple uh, triple daily Alaska to Seattle, Allegiant to the other Phoenix, Daily to Las Vegas and uh, twice a week to Palm to LA and Phoenix. Daily to Vegas and twice a week uh, to three times or maybe four times a week to Palm Springs. And then you've got Southwest once a week to Denver. Daily to Oakland and double daily to Vegas. See, I think you need to start like Bellingham to Cancun and capture all of the Vancouver traffic. Is there customs in Bellingham? Uh, there's the I mean the bridge is it's not very far. People is yeah, but if the building doesn't have a does the building have a CBP? Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. I don't think so. Yeah, not okay. so. All right. Some American beach destination. That... <laughs> Galveston. They thought Padre? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you could do, you could do, you know, uh, Tampa, maybe, or something. I mean, right, the Hawaii flights are gone. Those That's come and gone over the years, right? I wonder, that's actually not a bad idea. Like, could you do Hawaii out of there um, and and undercut Air Canada? Uh, they used to. Yeah, Alaska, Alaska used to have a bunch of lists. Yeah, it's an interesting one. But anyway. I thought it was seasonal. I thought so. Yeah, I mean, I was only looking at the, the numbers I was giving you were for April, um, just because that's what the default was. I'm looking now to see if there's some seasonal wide, but I, I do think that they exist at one point and are now gone. So, 
Yeah, yeah. Fascinating. All right, let's talk about uh, Aegean and uh, the A321LR play. So this is another one. Uh, they are going to put a premium cabin on board. Their existing planes are 220 seat. I'd say all economy, but they technically have a business class, but Europe is whatever. Um, they're going for live lap beds. They're going to put screens nose to tail. They're going to do satellite internet instead of air to ground so that the planes can fly further. And they have basically, they outlined the markets they think they can serve. And it's Africa, the Middle East, and even into South Asia. So they explicitly said, you know, Delhi and Mumbai, I think they'd have trouble getting slots at those. Um, Kazakhstan, interestingly, uh, some stuff across the Middle East, you know, whether it's Doha and Dubai, which I think maybe they already serve, but they also mentioned things like Bahrain and Muscat and other, you know, slightly smaller markets. Hmm. And then Addis and Nairobi and some other stuff across uh, Central Africa. All of what it, the goal is, you know, from four to seven hour flight times from Athens. Interesting. I mean, I think it's it's actually not a bad idea. Like they're kind of well positioned for that, and if they can pick up enough traffic, I think it it makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm I, the subfleet size. Like, what did you say? Did you say the number? Like how big? Four. Four. I mean, I mean, it's kind of an easy experiment for them at that point. It is. Um, the Interesting thing, they're like four planes flying four to eight hour stage length plus two hours at the far end and turn time. You can't go many places mm. with just four planes, right? Like if you're doing daily service, you can have six destinations, but you don't have to do daily service, right? And so, well, so this is the question is do they find markets that can serve sub daily and which ones make sense for that? And then also how many people want to just go to Athens versus use a GN for connecting flow? And I just don't know that. And where, like, Aegean flies to plenty of places in the rest of Europe, but, you know, where, where are you going to connect via Athens for? I, yeah, I'm trying to think. I mean, I guess you could do, I mean, you could, like, kind of rotate through Africa and then maybe the Middle East. I don't know. Like, one one day, one the next day. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's yeah, cool. The, it's, a, it's cool that they're trying new stuff. For sure. Yeah, I will say that, and, you know, reading into executive quotes in a press release, it's probably never a good idea, but you know the, the, the CEO's comment is the beginning of our long haul fleet or something like that. He, it's an initial four planes, but has potential to grow. So yeah. I think if they start and and it's still not till twenty twenty six and twenty seven these are going to get delivered. So they've got some time to develop markets, figure out what they think is going to work, and then make it go from there. Uh, I, w- I mean, do you think it's all going to be from Athens, or do you think they would try something from like a different? I mean, it has to be Athens because you couldn't do any kind of real connecting flow if it wasn't. But. Yeah, I think it, I think it has to be Athens. I mean, because Addis isn't that far; it's twenty one hundred, twenty two hundred miles. Okay. I mean, that's not it's not super far. I'm just looking. I was going to look at yeah. Dubai and see they're not like twenty. It's five hours, four yeah. hours. Um, I think, Mumbai, I think Delhi and Mumbai are the furthest that they mentioned, or Nairobi. Yeah, let me see what Nairobi is. Nairobi is twenty eight hundred miles, so I'm guessing Delhi is probably further than that. Yeah, Delhi's 3,100, and Mumbai, they, they're going to have Mumbai. Let's That's what, and again, by the time this happens, in theory, at least the new Mumbai airport will be open, so maybe they'll have access to that. Delhi and Mumbai are almost exactly the same. 30 Wait, but that, is that side for an area you can't fly over? Uh, it flies directly over Iraq and Iran. Yeah, so I'm thinking <laughs> in Syria. <laughs> yeah, so that might not be realistic at the moment. Well, they can fly down to the Red Sea and across Yemen. Oh, wait. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway. I'm, I'm done being snarky. Um, Ooh, never get it. Never get uh, Never surrender. Well, I mean, it's it's actually an interesting topic. Like, right? The, the yeah. The, the 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 political dynamics of the Middle East is like, and even Europe is throwing a real wrench in aviation at this point. Like, yes, for a couple of years now. Yeah. So, uh, all right, let's talk about Norse. So I'm good to talk. Cape Town. Yeah. Uh, three times a week for the upcoming northern winter. From where? Gatwick. Okay. Sorry, I forgot to put that in the um, <laughs> Here's the thing, like, that's one of those markets that's somewhat unlimited demand, I feel like. Someone mentioned online, like, Heath, uh, BA used to fly 777-4s at one point to Cape Town in the winter. Okay. So. Um, right now they're doing a uh, 777 and a 350, 1,000. Yeah. A lot of capacity. Um, and the, the, the main interesting thing to me about the Norse play is that it's a daytime flight northbound. So it that gets, probably, probably has more to do with capacity at Cape Town because Cape Town is kind of full. Yeah. And fleet utilization, right? Norse doesn't like leaving planes on the ground. So they can fly a plane. It's like a 
I want to say it's an 8 p.m. departure or 10 p.m. departure, gets it at 9 a.m., turns around at 11.30 and lands at 9.30 p.m. or something like that. And then... Virgin, Virgin does that today. Do they? Yeah. Interesting. Is that like that? So you basically burn the day on the return. You burn, yeah, but... Um, Which is fine. I'm, I'm you going... You, yeah. You don't burn the aircraft sitting on the ground. Um, again, you know, American carriers and, and South American carriers are just similar between, you know, big cities in Brazil and Argentina and Chile and the North America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it was a big deal when U.S. Airways got its slots in Rio and did a daytime flight northbound. So uh, depends on how far you're going. Miami, you can do a daytime both ways pretty easily. Other than that, it got harder. But the plane will sit overnight probably once it gets in at... Uh, Gatwick. At London, at Gatwick. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe they could repurpose it for like a midnight departure, but I'm not sure what they have that would line up with that. I mean, it's it's kind of nice that it's three times a week. I mean, they're they're trying a different market, which is nice to see. Yeah. They, it seems like they've kind of been hesitant to try brand new things. Um, I think the important thing here is this is the market that Norse, uh, that Norwegian didn't try, so they finally are proving that they're a different airline. Uh, I mean, that's that's what I was kind of getting at. Like, it's, yeah. you're kind of showing that, hey, you're not going to take the same plays out of their playbook and, and try them again, so... It's good. It's good to see. All right. Anything else you guys want to talk about? No. Well, we got some stuff in the bonus show, so you know, have to okay, fine. T- talk then. And we're going to talk about the travel portal from Capital One. We're going to talk about Allegiant and Seth's experience. We're going to talk about uh, B Regional um, and then some other things, including uh, the Dubai storm and recovery. Uh, so if you're a Patreon subscriber, stick around for that. If you're not, we do like hearing from you. Uh, so leave us a comment. Tweet us. We do. We, we do like to hear topics we've we've gotten one recently we're going to talk about it at some point in the future so yeah we appreciate it and uh, thanks for listening happy travels are you saying we don't like to hear from our patreon listeners yeah you know <laughs> y- yeah no we do okay take care <laughs> what bye